Hi, Lauren. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me, Sherry. I'm so happy you're here. So who's that? You have a little cat on your lap. Who is this joining us in the conversation? <laughs> this, this is Lulu. She is like the biggest love bug. <laughs> and when my lap is open, which is not very often, she just likes to scoop it right up. <laughs> Beautiful. I love that. I have also two dogs. They're such an important part of my life. And it's interesting. And I'm going to say this, but I, I have two daughters. I love them. I would take a bullet for them. However, what I've noticed about animals is really just this element of unconditional love. And so they've actually <laughs> exposed to me what unconditional love means. So um, I'm not sure if you feel the same way around animals or around pets, but this is definitely definite uh, perspective on love. Yeah, I do. I will say cats can hold grudges, so oh, right. <laughs> not for very long. <laughs> Thank goodness, not for very long. Yeah. So, Lauren, you've taught thousands of women and people through yoga, and your current spiritual passion is in harnessing the sacred feminine and guiding women and femmes to love themselves and to embrace wholeness. And so I'm so incredibly intrigued by that. And I'm certain the audience is too, especially around the conversation of sacred feminine. So first of all, I'm super curious as to what led you to this path, and then maybe also explain what that actually means. Sure. So it's been definitely a long journey to this path. And it, it's interesting. I know I say in my bio that it's my current passion. But just as you said that, I'm like, you know, it really has been my passion for a long time. I just haven't necessarily had like the language or the container to describe mm. exactly it in that way. But yeah, it's something I have taken years to to find and discover and and work with the energies over a long time so i'll start young i grew up in like a conservative evangelical christian climate uh, family and atmosphere um, i live in the midwest in the u.s super high achieving kid um, wanted to be the best at absolutely everything uh and just tried so hard to be quote unquote good girl right. like really just checking all the boxes all the time and being everyone for everything that became really unmanageable at a certain point for me uh, in my teenage years and I think manifested into an eating disorder and into anxiety and depression mm -hmm. and it was like as that was happening my worldview was shattering and I was left with just a lot of questions of what, who am I? What do I believe? Um, how do I like navigate this life? Because I've always made these assumptions that I would follow this very specific path that I've seen, but it feels as though it's not aligning for me and I just mm -hmm. feel different. I don't know if at the time I would have expressed it in that particular way, but looking back, that's how I see it. So that started this uh, decade long of self-discovery mixed with self-harm and just trying to learn how to heal from that while at the same time figuring out who I am. And it led me down a lot of different roads, but I would say most importantly down the road of really reconnecting with my body and learning about my mind and soul through through the practice of yoga. Um, and once I really harnessed my yoga practice, that's when the healing started to really speed up. It's where things started to make sense. It's where I really learned who I was and, and how I can serve the world too. And so I've spent the last 10 years or so teaching yoga and that has just snowballed into <laughs> to so many other things. So as far as the sacred feminine goes, growing up the way I did, I only saw the divine in this very specific way of being a male figure, being an authority authoritarian figure and as I started really opening myself up and learning more especially about yoga I was exposed to goddesses in different traditions and cultures past and present all over the world and for the first time I was really able to see the divine in myself and myself in the divine in a way that felt more authentic and I started working with those energies and embodying them and and learning even what they were and what I learned from studying all of these different goddesses and 
working with them in this embodied way is that there's really no one way to be a woman. There's really no one way to be divine, mm -hmm. that we get to be this spectrum of things. And in that, I've been really connecting with like what that means within me. And that's where this concept of the inner goddess has has manifested in my life and in my teaching of yeah, there are all these different goddesses and gods and different traditions, but truly we have this direct access to the divine, which is what I call the inner goddess. Oh, that's so, so beautiful. In a nutshell. <laughs> in a nutshell, just really, you know, to sum yeah. it all up, that's so beautiful. And and I have more questions around that, but I just want to actually re rewind just a moment. And, and just even as you're sharing, I just feel this gorgeous energy. And I, I think I already shared this with you. You have this beautiful sense of calmness. And I, I totally feel that feminine energy just coming off of you. And, and I don't know if I shared this with you, Lauren, but that was actually my big goal over the last, I would say, four or five years was to really step into feminine energy. And had you met me five years ago, because I come from a background where I've had to overcome massive struggle, I had to overcome major injury, I really got in to my masculine energy and it was always about being strong i could do things myself i am resourceful i am adaptable and as a result of that i even just started to see the way that that affected my mood and started to show up in different areas of my life and so what i actually started to do just to even get more into that feminine energy was just it first started off by okay i'm just gonna even change how i dress and I, and just by changing how i dress i started to change how i acted and then all of a sudden it was all these other things and and then I started to feel that reflection of that connection with the divine as you're sharing. But before we get into that um, and ask you more questions around that, you mentioned something around your journey in your, from your younger self as you did start, struggle with anorexia. That was a journey where you mentioned was a lot of self-discovery and self-harm. And so coming back to that space in your life, why do you feel that you started to control and restrict food in a way that would help you also control your environment. What what led you to start engaging in that particular behavior? Hmm. Yeah, I think there's, there's a few things. Um, I love that question because it's never really about food, right? It, that's just a symptom of something else going on, essentially. Ah, you know, one thing was like the, the most... I'll say like surface level thing was I was a competitive dancer and I was, you know, kind of on track to becoming professional and there's this expectation of what to look like. And it's, it's so interesting because other athletes are kind of taught and expected to fuel their bodies in this way that helps fuel their performance. But when it comes to dance, a lot of times it's fueled by aesthetics uh, so you're expected to perform at a high level and look at this really specific way that if you were, if you're dancing all day, like you need to fuel yourself. But it, so it becomes this very unsustainable thing for a lot of people. And that's absolutely what it became for me. Also, I started really opening my mind and I realized that the religion that I grew up in really wasn't what I believed anymore. So suddenly it, it was, mm. you know, is that freeing in a way? Yes. But I think when you're still like when your brain isn't developed yet and that's all, you know, it, it feels very chaotic. Right. Um, and I felt like I had no coping mechanisms and nothing really to lean on anymore. Um, also like beyond that, there is so much outer messaging mm -hmm. about what a woman should look like in our society, how yes. she should act what she should feel like, how she should be to, with other people. And that feels so confining. And I think a lot of times eating disorders manifest in that way. Um, so I, th I think there's a lot and there's some sexual trauma too. And a few other things that I think just felt really out of control in my life at the time. Also, I didn't put this together until I was older, which is funny enough, because I think as teenagers, we're so self-absorbed most of the time, but my eating disorder really spiraled out of control um, around the time of like 9-11, like I was a senior in high school, and I remember sitting in school and watching it happen, and it was two months later that I was put in the hospital, so I, you know, I would have never connected that funny enough at that time, but now I look back and I'm like, well, of course, things felt really out of control, so sorry, yes, Look at the iPad. <laughs> Sorry, my daughter is <laughs> screaming for me. <laughs> Hi, hun. <laughs> okay, honey. 
you just right. eating pizza and watching TV. <laughs> perfect. What, what I love about this and, and here's what you're showing me and anyone else listening is that there's this gorgeous balance that you have where you're, you're on this conversation with me and yet there's so much attention given to your daughter and I could not find that more beautiful. And imagine that just, mm -hmm. I see that, that empowerment that you have. And, and I'm curious if that is that drive also from that sacred feminine. So I, I want to just understand a little bit more around this energy. Um, and then of course, link that into how you have overcome this eating disorder from such a young age and how that again ties in to just feeling a little bit of that liberation that you were talking about. So going from that extreme mm. control of feel it, things feeling out of control in your life to suddenly feeling that space of surrender where you are surrendering to this divine, this, this higher power, but also as an effect of that somehow also gaining control, but in a very different way. So could you expand on that a little bit? Sure. And I'll start with saying I still struggle with control. <laughs> I think it's it's just a dance that we're all we're all dancing because it's part of who we are. So when I'm talking about feminine and masculine energies, I'm not really talking about a gender or sexual um organs or anything like that. They're energies that live within all of us. So the masculine energies are uh, more structured. They're more linear, more penetrative, they call them solar, like in in yoga, be solar associated with the sun. The feminine qualities are more receptive, more cyclical, more lunar. Um, they're more subtle a lot of times. So you can think of them as like the yang and the yin as well. A lot of people are familiar with that concept where the yang, yang is more fiery, the yin is more cool. So they're energies that work together with, within all of us. Given, put to the extreme, the masculine would look like over control uh, within our own being. Within society, it looks like over control too. It could look like fascism. It could look like colonialism. It can look like these things that are really pervasive uh, in our culture. Mm -hmm. The masculine or the feminine when out of balance can lead to chaos, mm -hmm. right? So there's this dance I think that we have between chaos and control. Mm -hmm. And, you know, yoga talks about these concepts of that work together of action and surrender. So it's all about kind of finding this balance within. And the reason I'm so focused on the feminine is just because the masculine is so pervasive in our culture. Like I was talking about, I had this, um, such a drive to succeed at such a young age. Right. And then suddenly I was faced with like, well, what does that even mean? Like, what is success and, mm -hmm. and what is happiness? Um, so embracing the feminine energies more has brought more balance and peace into my life. But I think with balance, it's never like, okay, I've reached it. <laughs> it's just, it's a constant dance, right? Between this, this chaos and, and the control. And I think that like sweet spot in between is, is this flow state. Yeah. Does that answer it? Yeah, that's so beautiful. I love that so much. And, and I always like to sort of visualize the feminine en energy as being the sea, right? You can't control the turbulence. You, you can't control the environment. You can't control the tide. And then the masculine energy is the ship navigating through the sea where, like you were saying, it's stable, it's linear, it's driven, mm -hmm. it's there, there's a direction it's moving towards. And, and it's so beautiful. And I, and you've just explained that so gorgeously. And I, I don't, I haven't actually heard it being explained in that way. Um, and that makes actually a lot of sense. And, and what I also noticed that you share is just that the intention of actually stepping into this energy and what's important about that is also to note that we all have masculine feminine energy we are sperm and egg and so this exists in us but again just to be more intentional around it how would you for example guide someone to embrace more of their feminine energy or to even step into that divine goddess or that sacred feminine as you share Hmm. Yeah, there are so many different ways. And sometimes what I recommend would really be based on on the person. But let's talk about like a high achieving driven woman. That's probably one that you know, and one that I know who uh, has a good job and maybe has kids and wants 
everything to be perfect in their house and works out every day and, you know, has from the outside their shit together, right? (laughs) That's how we would call it. But on the inside, there might be parts of them that are screaming because they're not connected to their creativity Mm -hmm. and they don't have time to relax and receive. They're always giving to others. Um, They might have things that they would like to voice, but they don't to keep, to keep the peace. Mm -hmm. Um, So there are definitely a lot of antidotes to this, I think. And one would be connecting with nature. So nature, mother earth herself is the feminine, right? And I think, By connecting, I mean spending time outside, of course, but it also means like really considering our relationship with nature and that we are a part of nature as well. Mm -hmm. And in that, observing how she works and seeing how we work too. So in nature, uh, you know, except for maybe tropical climates, it's not summer all the time, right? And we can't, as women, perform like it's summer all the time. We have our own seasons, uh, as does nature. So I think like feeling that connection is really important. Um, I know I've seen quotes that are like, we can't all blossom all the time, right? Like it's, we're going to have our phases. So that being said, um, you know, connecting to nature, but being outside is important. But I think if one has a menstrual cycle, connecting with that is extremely important because that is also how we connect to nature. Um, historically our cycles have have flowed with the moon and the way that it cycles and when we make that connection we really see like like the moon we're not meant to show up exactly the same every day that sometimes we're going to be full Uh ovulating (laughs) and sometimes we're not we're going to be shedding and we're going to be anew with like the new moon Mm -hmm. uh right regardless of whether or not someone bleeds, we can still connect to that moon energy and start to feel those phases within ourselves and also start to see the beauty in those different phases because they're all beautiful. We don't have to be the shiny, magnetic, full moon, ovulating person all the time. We we also get to be, sorry, we also get to be in our darkness. Mm. Yeah. And be in the quiet and be in our anger and, and, you know, be in all of these different phases that come with that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, So that's a couple different ways, but there are so many. Um, That's just, I think, a great place to start because paying attention to our own cycles, our own moods, our own hormones really connects us back to the earth energy, which is feminine in its nature. Right. Yeah. So beautiful. And, And I remember even reading somewhere that even when a woman goes through menopause, she still follows the cycle. So whether or not there's actual bleeding or not, she's still actually following the cycles of the moon and and still very energetically connected to feminine energy. And so do you know anything about that? Have you heard about that? Or is this really just sort of focused on women as they are actually menstruating and have a particular cycle? No, I I think that anybody can connect to these energies and the moon's a really good way. So even in my book, I have like a, um, just a mini guide for the different phases of the cycle that align with the phases of the moon. And I say, if you don't have a cycle or maybe you're on birth control or something like that, or you're you're postmenopausal, you can just look at the moon phases and connect with that and see if your energies align with it. And if not, they might be flipped around and that's okay too. I think the exercise is really in the observation of it and the awareness. So beautiful. I love that. Yeah, we'll definitely will check that out. And so you also mentioned earlier when, when the feminine energy is out of balance, there's a lot of chaos. So could you expand on that a little bit? Yeah, that would be um, the person who maybe has a hard time holding down a job or a relationship and they kind of flow from one thing to the other without any particular plan and without any particular container, maybe to hold their ideas. And that can lead to a lot of suffering as well. Um, You know, I think we all need to be able to ground our ideas and we all need, and we all need somewhat of a structure to flow within. I don't see that as much throughout people just because of the way that our culture is, I think. Um, and I, but sometimes I think when people burn out that they can lean heavily toward that overly 
right. um, feminine side in a way, just because, you know, we veer toward the opposite sometimes when something else hasn't been working or our body gives us no choice. Mm, I love that. So good. So good. And so if you were to have somebody really embrace radical wholeness, as you discuss, what does that look like? What does it mean to have radical wholeness? Yeah, I, I think of it in a couple different ways. One of them is, and this one might be a little harder to embody at first for people, but at least in my heart and my mind, we're all divine. Mm -hmm. We all are a piece of the divine. Mm -hmm. Because of that, we're whole. Are we human too? Are we flawed? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, but how could we not be whole? Mm -hmm. You know, if if we are if we are sacred. On the other hand, we're human, right? And we have all of these different things that make us who we are. And radical wholeness is really shining light on those things, like becoming aware of all the different things that make us who we are and offering compassion and love to all of those parts as well. Mm. So it would be called, it would be living in a way that's like fully expressed, right? There isn't any part of us that we have kind of shoved down right we've actually like done the excavation work <laughs> and and we do it with kindness and with love not with shame mm. it takes a lot of practice I think to right. do that um, but I work with like in my book and with clients with the chakra system it's this energy system in the body and each of these energy centers holds different information about who we are you don't have to believe in the centers to benefit from them they are just a really great way to look at our wholeness, I think, because they each, yeah, hold this, like the, like the root holds this connection to the earth. It holds our physical body, our safety. We move up to the sacral and it holds like our creativity and sensuality. And as we work our way up these centers, we work our way to the more ethereal realms. Um, but I like to have clients really like look into all these different centers to to do that process of excavation, of truly getting to know themselves and of like shining love onto the shadows right. um so that's getting into like a whole different topic or not i don't want to say different topic but it's a whole can of worms because mm -hmm. it is uh you know involved a bit but i love i love that system because it's not just looking at ourselves as a body or as a mind it's really holistic mm -hmm. and we get to like just be be whole right we get to like be all these things even if it's not perfect even if there are parts of ourselves we don't like that much it still is it's holy yeah. in a way it's yeah. divine still it's so beautiful and it's human I, yeah <laughs> I love that I love how you've explained that and and you know interesting I'm you know my background is really in science and when I first came across the chakra system it was very hard for me to make that tangible um, but what's super interesting is that every single energy center if you don't want to refer to them as a chakra but if every single energy center is looked at every single center has a magnetic field there's actually a nerve bundle there there are hormones associated with that nerve bundle in the area and so when we when we get to that tangibility around it and really notice that it is actually is measurable i find that it's it's much easier to work with and then start to understand even what that physical impact in the body is especially as you were talking about if we talked about talk about the second center and understand that's my safety in my environment and that is my feeling of space around who I'm spending time with we notice that when there's a block there of course it can lead to digestive issues or, or other issues and so it's super interesting to address that because I couldn't agree more that that is that that allowance for that wholeness and realize that our thoughts manifest in our body our emotions manifest in our body and that they are all connected. Whatever we think will impact our energy centers. However, we experience our environment and we experience the world around us also very much uh, interacts with the energy centers. And so it's a beautiful new perspective, I believe, for anyone who hasn't been exposed to these types of conversations and, and really, really powerful. Again, for anyone who maybe wants to look at it being a little bit more scientific, there's also a lot of science behind that um, as well that can expand on that. Um, and so Lauren, I'm, I'm curious because I know you've been in the yoga space for a long time. I know you certify teachers and you're super, you're super keen around yoga being safe and also that there's an intelligent design around yoga and something that you refer to a lot. And I'm curious what that means to you in terms of yoga being safe and also more of an intelligent perspective. Yeah, I think that 
Well, it's really interesting. I'll, I'll answer this by going back to a second to what you said a moment ago about the importance of like, uh, you know, for anyone who's skeptical to embrace the science around it, um, yoga is designed to be safe. Mm -hmm. I think when it's presented through our Western culture, I mean, honestly, through just humans, because <laughs> we're all flawed, right? It can become an unsafe space in different ways. Um, but what I love is that, you know, the philosophy really lends itself to modern science. So the yoga that I, that I practice and teach would be considered trauma informed, right? Because we understand like how the nervous system works. And then we understand how to present yoga in such a way that, that helps build resiliency and allows people to feel safe within the environment. Um, so it's kind of interesting because it was built to be that way. And it wasn't built that way because they understood our technicalities behind it or or the Western science. It was built that way uh, from their understanding of science, right? Their meaning the the originators of yoga, like in the Vedic traditions in, in what's now India. So that's pretty interesting. And I think um, when we look at the chakra system too, or anything that's like energy related, like traditional Chinese medicine or Thai medicine, whatever it might be, to approach it with respect and reverence as you would Western medicine, mm -hmm. um, because it has been revered as a science for a long time, just not in the way that we are used to and these things weren't just made up by like one person they are energies that have been downloaded or tapped into by many people through observation and meditation over thousands of years so i think to discount that as woo is honestly ethnocentric mm. um but also to know that you know, Western science maybe hasn't caught up with, <laughs> with some of it yet. And there are things we don't understand. That being said, I'd say it's really great to try it on and see how it feels. And I think thinking about it that way, it allows us to have an open mind without feeling like we need to adapt these beliefs permanently. Um, we get to just kind of, yeah, see, see how it feels in our own being and go from there. Um, so, yeah, I think it's, it's interesting. Like we have, we have all this information now about trauma and how it works in the body how to how to avoid triggering people how to build resilience mm -hmm. we do that as teachers through our language by offering lots of choices by setting up the environment in specific ways um but i think yoga like in its purest sense was meant to be that way and we've had to unlearn just a lot of the <laughs> things that like naturally traumatize us in our society as as humans together um, right. So that means like, you know, not creating competitive environments, right? right. It's more collaborative and allowing people to really like ex have autonomy and explore their own practice rather than fit them into little boxes and, and expect their body to be a certain way. Um, but that's all things I think we've had to learn over the last few decades because we've been doing it wrong, <laughs> honestly. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Yeah. And there's some some documentaries on Netflix, um, without bringing up any names that have been showed, um, you know, what that power looks like. And, and, you know, and I love that you said it's actually humans, and it's a human error, because that's really what it is, regardless of who's teaching it, and the moment that you have power and, and even just teaching a yoga class. So when I teach a yoga class, or, or I teach a class, you, you, you have the attention, you have the focus of, of every single student in the class. And that is to that is to be very cautioned because there is influence there and what you do say and how you do behave automatically will impact and influence every single student in the class. And I love that you bring that approach of trauma informed because you don't force people into postures. You don't push them down physically. In my opinion, you don't even touch people unless you take permission. So it's all these little teeny tiny things that are so incredibly important and and really to be considered in terms of of creating that safe space for every single person. And, you know, when I did my yoga teacher training, a lot of of the influence also was around muscle activation and just this this idea of this prolonged passive stretch, especially in flexion, 
when the majority of our day is inflection can create harm in the body. And you see a lot of people also going to yoga and injuring their neck or injuring their lower back because they're forced into these postures that their body's not ready for. They've been sitting all day. They've been in flexion all day. They've been like this all day. And then the majority of the practice is also in flexion. So what is your perspective around that in terms of just caring for the physical body and maybe also avoiding some potential injury? Yeah, I, I love that observation. It's interesting while you're talking, I'm always thinking of these like plays between the mas masculine and feminine. So the hyper-masculine yoga environment would be like the teacher knows best and they're going to put you into these positions and they're going to use their, their hands to push you or manipulate you into them. And you're going to go as deep as you possibly can. And um, the more feminine is allowing this space for autonomy, options, choices, props, uh, consent, all of these different things. Um, and then the layer on top of that is like, we get to benefit now from, from the Western science, right. And seeing that like, yeah, doing a bunch of standing forward folds without like activating the glutes and hamstrings is not good for most people and leads to things like yoga, butt, just like <laughs> uh, hamstrings, like detaching from the glutes, like all these horrible things. So I think we get to start integrating the more masculine areas of fitness into the more passive yoga to create this integration. So it comes back to this sense of like balance. How do we, mm -hmm. how do we balance the mobility with the strength? How do we balance the masculine with the feminine okay. within a group environment within the individual body? So yeah, I love this discussion. It's, it's a lot of fun. Um, so much has changed even like since I started teaching yoga, for instance, uh, when I started taking a lot of classes, I remember so many teachers saying to relax the glutes and bridge pose right. where like they're really the main mover in that extension. Right. So right. a lot has changed as far as like teachers being aware of of cueing different activations in the body. <laughs> Thankfully, um, longevity is really important to me in the practice and safety and longevity comes with that intelligence of like, OK, what can I strengthen right now? And what can, what can I relax? Mm -hmm. And just to bring this full circle, we're talking about these opposing energies and in yoga philosophy, they talk about the action and the surrender. So even in a pose, like what action are you taking? And then what are you softening? What can you surrender? Mm -hmm. um, and that's always happening. Oh, so beautiful. Wow. I love how you've shared that. that I, that's really gorgeous. I don't think I've ever actually integrated or even observed the practice of yoga with with that perspective in terms of masculine feminine energy and and i just love how you've shared that that's gorgeous um okay so you also talk about being an intuitive and helping people harness their their ability to be intuitive and so in in my perspective i believe we all are intuitive and it's really just around the surrendering and the tapping in and being open to receive and i'm just curious what it means for you to be able to harness that particular ability to connect and to receive information in that way? Yeah, for me, it's been really empowering. So um, I noticed in, uh, I'm a Reiki practitioner and, and teaching yoga that I was oftentimes doing things really intuitively. Like my best classes would come when I didn't overly plan and I would leave a lot of space for spontaneity and to just respond to what was in front of me. I also noticed that um, you know, I've always been a really sensitive person and sometimes I'll carry around really heavy feelings and I'll realize not usually in the moment, but I'll realize that they're not mine. Uh -huh. So I'd maybe feel a certain way before leading a class or, or doing like a Reiki session with somebody and think it's mine. I'm like, Oh, what is wrong with me? Why do I feel this like yucky energy or this and that? And then realize afterwards, like I was just getting tuned into like what they were feeling, which is really helpful information, but not when you aren't aware <laughs> that that's right. what's going on. So in the last couple of years, I've really um, focused on harnessing my intuition and learning how to use it and creating boundaries around it as well. Mm -hmm. um, and that's been really great for me, not only, you know, in helping clients and things like that, but just to use in my everyday life and to, to have I'll say like cleaner energy to feel like I'm kind of letting things move instead of holding on to other people's stuff. 
it's funny as I'm talking because I'm realizing like, oh, that's what's been happening with me lately. Um, the world's been a really heavy place and it can be really hard to like be, a, I think anybody, but also to be a sensitive person and to be holding that weight all the time without some way to get it out of the body and, and let it flow. Um, but yeah, for me, harnessing the intuition has been really great because when I can hear it and I follow it, it really is this like inner guide and inner compass. And I find a lot of people that I work with do have this really strong intuition, but lack the trust to follow through with it. Um, and not only that, but the world is a noisy place and our minds are, can be very noisy places. So being able to hear that voice that is quieter, the intuition typically is, I call it a voice that can appear in a lot of different ways, but it's more subtle. Right. Um, so to access that can be, can be tough. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think that has to also come in from leaning in on your more feminine energy versus being more in the masculine, because that is the energy of receivership. And, and I noticed that too, when I'm not on social media, and I've actually I've been so so grateful that I've I've really limited my time. I also set a lot of boundaries for myself in terms of how much I'm on screen time or how much I'm connected. But the more I step away from that, like you said, the noisiness of it and and just feeling that constant need and that trigger to be connected in that way and to have that significance and that feedback come in from social media. I feel like the more that I'm disconnected, the more I'm connected with nature, the more I'm, I'm really in that place of receivership and ingratitude. That's where I'm really more open to receive all of those downloads and, and be connected more intuitively. And so what would you say around that in terms of, of having that clearer signal, if there is a way or if there's a strategy around connecting a little bit more to your intuition, what could that look like? Or how could you support someone in, in harnessing that connection? Yeah, I, I love that insight. It's so spot on. Um, yeah, when I think about the third eye, which is the area for intuition, you know, the more masculine aspects are intellect um, and logic, and then the more feminine aspects that are receptive are, are intuition and this higher wisdom. And there are different ways to connect, but I'd say um, the body is actually like number one for me. So uh, moving mm -hmm. <laughs> and the, moving the energy, also getting outside, basically clearing space. And when I do that, that puts me in a more receptive space. So um, whatever we need to do to relax is mm -hmm. so important. I've received all of my biggest inspirations in that more receptive, relaxed state. Mm -hmm. And it can be so hard to get there when we're in our masculine and when we're moving and driving and uh, handling this and this and this and this, <laughs> we, you know, we might need to take a shower. We might need to take a walk outside. We might need to stop everything, and get a massage if that's something that's available to us. Um, I think it's important for the individual to think about what, when do you feel most relaxed? When do you feel most receptive? When do you feel most open? And how can you create a strategy to get there? Um, and it, like I said, the body might be one of the keys because it's not like we can just be like, okay, I'm going to relax now. Mm. It just doesn't work that way. Right. Right. Yeah. <laughs> there <laughs> usually needs to be some sort of energy that needs to move to get to that state. Um, let alone just like, you know, for me, I have a three-year-old and a career and a house and, you know, all the things. So sometimes it takes creating arrangements and getting help to, to be able to get in that space for me. Oh, so good. I love that. I love that. I love you. And I love this conversation so much. And as we wrap up today, I just want to thank you so much for being on here today. There's so much value here and so many golden nuggets. And I'm curious, Lauren, if there was anything else that you wanted to share that you didn't have a chance to just yet. Yeah, thanks for asking. And I love you too. You're amazing. And I love what you're doing. And, and thanks for creating this space for these conversations. Um, we touched on a lot of the things I care about and I'm passionate about. And I just wanted to share about my book that, you know, if these topics sound interesting, that creates form for all of this and an actual like guide to travel through all of these different concepts and to discover them within yourself. It's called Embody Your Inner Goddess, A Guided Journey to Radical Wholeness. And it is out and available now where you buy your books. And it is something not meant to just 
be read like all in one sitting. It's to be savored over time. I've structured it like a course. So it's a seven week journey through this energy system in the body to harness the sacred feminine within and your own inner goddess. And in that we get to look at all of these different qualities. Some are fun to look at, some are, you know, not as fun to look at. And we get to shine light and love on each of these things. And um, it's my my way of kind of packaging up my my story and my struggles and this journey to to healing and making it really accessible and digestible for anyone else who wants to take on this work. Oh, so beautiful. I'm definitely going to check that out. And so if somebody wanted to reach out, Lauren, and connect with you, where could they go to do that? Yeah, you can find me at laurenleduc.com and that can funnel you into all a lot of freebies that I have that have to do with the energy system and yoga, um, as well as my book and classes and courses and all that sort of stuff, retreats. And um, I'm also on Instagram at I am Lauren Leduc, and that's where I tend to to spend most of my limited social media time. <laughs> trying to create boundaries around that too it's such a great tool to connect obviously um but also can become overwhelming so used mindfully come visit me and if you listen to this and want to connect feel free to dm me too um i love to hear directly from people i think uh folks like you and i love putting this kind of content out there and sometimes we don't always know how it lands and uh, what kind of effect it has. So it always just feels so magical to to hear directly from people. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we'll definitely add all that to the show notes. So thanks so much again, Lauren. I've loved this conversation so much. I did too. Thanks for having me and my cat and my daughter. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, it was we so much fun. <laughs> again at any time. <laughs> It's all the feminine energy coming at you. <laughs> Absolutely. Thanks, Sherry.